This is Professor Slaughter. Um, in an effort to maximize what you were able to understand and apply in this course, this video has been prepared to review factors of production, comparative advantage, trading blocks, and market entry models. Now, without a firm understanding of these topics, it would be very difficult for you to progress in the course and make meaningful contributions to classroom discussions. We will make reference to these topics throughout the course, and if you have any questions relating to this lecture, um, make a note to ask those questions the first night of class. We will start with factors of production. The factors of production are inputs into the production process regardless of whether or not you're producing a good. You might be producing a service. And these basic building blocks are combined in creative, innovative, and enticing ways to create the products and services you purchase, which provides revenue back to the company. In essence, entrepreneurs who are the risk takers and the business owners combine the factors of production in a way that generates profit. Now, why is this important? Well, it's important because when we speak of factors of production in the global environment, not all countries have access to all the factors of production and not all citizens of every country have access to all the factors of production. The factors of production are land, labor, entrepreneurship, capital, and recently I have even noticed that there are fifth and sixth factors used on occasion and those factors are energy and knowledge. So regardless of which business classes you have taken, you would have seen these factors of production listed in some way with or without energy and knowledge as two of those factors. Now, in the, in the United States, as a market that is founded upon the tenets of capitalism, we believe that these factors of production should be held in the hands of individuals or the private sector. If we want to buy land, we can buy it from someone else. We do not have to appeal to the government to allow the purchase. We can freely sell our labor and buy labor from others if we need it. We can select whatever career we want and pursue it as a business owner or an employee. In essence, we have the right to start a business and keep the profits. And the last factor of the top four, capital, um, we have a strong banking system and we have confidence in that system. And because of that, we are able to obtain long-term loans and secure additional capital. Now you will notice that I tied in the availability of the factors of production with the tenets of capitalism. And I do that because in a capitalistic society or in a near capitalistic society, our beliefs and values guarantee access to these production, these factors of production. Now capitalists believe that you have rights and these rights are called tenets. The tenets of capitalism are one, you have the right to own property. Two, you have the right to own a business and keep the profits. Three, you have the right to choose. Four, you have the right to complete to compete. And you can see after reviewing this list of the rights that the factors of production in this country are within your reach. Uh, but what if you lived in a country that did not subscribe to the beliefs that we have? What if the government owned some or all of the real estate? What if you had to work the job that the government demanded you work and your labor could only be sold when and if you were found favor with found favor with the government? What if you lived in a country where any financial gains were made? Um, what if you lived in a country where any financial gains you made could be seized without due process? And what if only those in power could access the foreign exchange market or borrow money? Under these conditions, it is easy to see what access, why access to the factors of production are so important. It also becomes very clear that without the factors of production, the business environment would not be a favorable one. Now if you remember from your economic classes, the theory of comparative advantage was one in which the capabilities of different countries would be compared. And the country that could manufacture or produce a product more efficiently and at a lower cost would have the advantage over all the other countries. Now why is this important to this class? When it comes to comparative advantage, a country should export what it produces efficiently and cost effectively and then import what it needs and cannot produce at a reasonable cost. And if we think about this from a practical perspective, it makes sense. If we are comparing U.S. production of rice with China's production of rice, it is clear that China has both the land, labor, and resources to cost effectively produce rice. For the United States, we would not have the vast amount of land needed nor the cheap labor required and probably not the water either. So in the case of rice, China has the comparative advantage when compared to the United States. Now, the United States'
based upon this, um, the United States should import rice, which it cannot grow efficiently, and use its own resources to manufacture something that it excels in, like pharmaceuticals or weapons or high technology products. And comparative advantage also applies to individuals, and you make these kind of decisions all day long. Let's think about what you buy. You are not going to plant wheat, mill it, and make, cere um, and make cereal for your family. You're going to buy cereal and put your labor to work somewhere else. Before buying drapes, you might consider if it is cheaper for you to buy drapes or make drapes, especially if you have a talent in that area. Before hiring a landscaper, you would consider whether or not you had the time and talent to do it yourself. If you do, you might do the landscaping yourself. And if not, you would hire someone who has a comparative advantage to you and then maybe work some overtime shifts to pay for the landscaper. And understanding how comparative advantage drives decisions will help you understand why business opportunities travel to other parts of the world. Now that we have reminded ourselves that opportunity follows access to the factors of production and comparative advantage dictates um, to which countries the opportunities flow, we can now move on to trading blocks. Now, trading blocks are used to regain some of the advantages lost in comparative advantage. What do I mean by this? Well, if we do not have trading blocks, then we are always driven by the theory of comparative advantage. But by forming trading blocks, we give countries who are the members of these trading blocks preferential treatment over all the other countries. And it is in this way that we strip some of the comparative advantage away. Now, some of the more common trading blocks are NAFTA, North American Free Trade Agreement, which includes the United States, Canada, and Mexico. And by forming that trade agreement, we gave preferential treatment to Canada and Mexico, and some of the benefits of NAFTA are not shared with other countries. Now think about the European Union. The European Union is a very sophisticated type of economic union where they even share the same currency and have a common external trade policy. Now the European Union has created an us and them type of structure where they highly promote free trade among the European countries and then deny all the countries the same all other countries the same benefits. Now the ASEAN group includes the Sultanate of Brunei, Cambodia, Indonesia, Laos, Malaysia, Myanmar, Philippines, Singapore, Thailand, and Vietnam. And you will notice that in the ASEAN group, and these countries are shown in red over by um, in the um, Pacific, South Pacific, um, you will note that in the ASEAN group, there are no really large countries, so by joining together, they have increased their negotiating power on the world market. Now, the other thing that you might notice is that China is not part of this group either. It is quite possible that these countries join together to also increase their negotiating power with China. After all, China has become our low-cost producer in the United States, and these smaller countries of the ASEAN group have become the low-cost producers for China and as a group, they carry more influence and can better protect their own market. Now this slide, this slide shows you some of the trading blocks around the world. There are also trade agreements that are in place between one country and another, or maybe even a group of countries, but the trading blocks seem to carry more weight. Now the last thing I want to remind you of is the method of market entry. And there are several different ways to enter a foreign market and there are advantages and disadvantages to each model. Now if you want to maximize your control, um, you also dramatically increase your cost. Now FDI is the most expensive way to enter a foreign market um, and that in this slide is considered uh, direct investments. Now another fairly expensive way to enter a foreign market is to form a joint venture. Now you still have a good amount of control in a joint venture, but because another country company is normally involved, you must work hard to make sure that agreements are in place that protect those valuable company assets and trade secrets. In licensing, the company has a lesser degree of control and substantially gives up rights to how the product is being produced. Now the farm partner would enter into the licensing agreement and would agree to pay the corporation a fee or royalty um, based upon the quantity that it manufactures and the use of the trademark. In direct exporting, the costs are very low and even the small companies can enter a foreign market in this way. 
And indirect exporting simply means that you sell your product to another agent, broker, or producer who will ultimately sell your product overseas. Your costs are minimum with indirect exporting, but you have absolutely no control beyond the sale point. As we evaluate trade flows and learn to make decisions regarding strategies in the global environment, these topics should be at the forefront of your mind, and we will build upon these topics and these theories throughout the class and learn more about the countries individually as well.